Hello and welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm John Bachman. Joining us right now on the phone from his district near Houston, Texas, is Congressman Steve Stockman. He serves in the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And Congressman, it's great to have you with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you taking the time to take my uh, call. No, no problem. No problem. Let's start with Benghazi and the new information that charges have been filed against a guy named Abu Qatala. He is the leader of the Libyan branch of Ansar al-Sharia, a militia that has yet to receive terror organization status from the State Department. I want to address that issue separately in just a second, but first I wanted to get your reaction to these new charges uh, that come almost a full year after the attack on the U.S. consulate. Well, I find it ironic, because you know, we had several hearings in which, in which witnesses at the last minute uh, decide not to show up for our hearing. We still haven't heard from some of the people that were there. In fact, I'm not sure we've heard from anybody that was there. We still haven't gotten a letter from the State Department uh, issuing a statement allowing uh, witnesses to come forward and testify because they're under apparently a secret agreement. Uh, what we're really asking uh, John Kerry and the State Department to do is issue a letter stating that they can testify. Now, I understand somebody else gave a quasi-okay, but we need it in writing, and we need a strong, firm answer. And that's why we need a special prosecutor. Yeah, I, I talked to a Congressman Frank Wolf about this. He said there's really no information out there or that's not out there that would be revealed if these folks were to testify. I know also that you and some other members of the House Republican Caucus have been pressing FBI, uh, the new FBI director, James Comey, to step up this investigation. Do you feel like these new charges are a response to those concerns that were expressed? Well, I can assure you if it was four dead congressmen or uh, if it was... Uh Stephen Colbert's sister, because he was mocking us for calling for a special investigation. There'd be a special investigation. It's sad that we have four patriots that were murdered on 9-11. It was portrayed more as a video in anger, just kind of like well, now we're portraying the Texas massacre as nothing more than the in-house violence or workplace violence. And it, it's, we got to come to grips that we're at war, and we need to, we need to investigate this so it doesn't happen again. And unfortunately, because we're not allowed to investigate, it might happen again. And this is because this administration has stonewalled us in every every way possible to get to the bottom of it. And I think it really has to do with the uh, future uh, election of, or attempted election by Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's certainly one possibility. I think, uh, you know, for the most part, I think everybody would agree that nobody wants to see something like this happen again. But if you could uh, excuse me and allow me to be very cynical for a moment, uh, do you think these charges really is maybe just an attempt to distract our attention following the release of some of this uh, new information that came out last week that dozens of CIA officers were on the ground at the time of the attack and that those CIA officers and, who, and other personnel may now be uh, perhaps are being pressured allegedly to keep quiet under the threat of weekly polygraph tests? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. This administration is always, uh, I call him the magician because he's always doing sleight of hand. Uh, people will forget that when all this was taking place, he decided to go to Africa. Then when he decided to change the law unilaterally, which is unusual that the president thinks he has that kind of power, he did it while the press was in the plane flying over back to the United States so that they couldn't comment, all the uh, Washington press corps was. So, no, he totally is one of the most political animals, a uh, very Chicago-style type uh, politician that's uh, ruling our country right now. Unfortunately, we see repeat behavior across the board of this kind of uh, manipulation of the press, which they seem to be willing to uh, participate in. And so, in other words, you say that the, the, the announcement of these charges, there's some other motivation here, aside from just the fact that this is the natural time that this uh, happened to be filed, these charges happen to be filed. Well, I, I think it's, it's one of many things. It's a diversion, and, and he called it himself a silly little, uh, I, I guess the description was it wasn't a real investigation or scandal, and mocking it and repeated uh, speeches. So, yeah, he's trying to trivialize it and make him look like he's, uh, doing something, but in reality, the, the only thing that would really count is if we had a special prosecutor. We did a, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we're, we're doing a discharge petition where you want to encourage all your listeners and viewers to uh, watch and pressure their congressman, Tom Hall, means to sign a discharge petition to get Frank's Swift bill enacted, which would force the, or make the speaker appoint a special prosecutor. And that's totally up into John Boehner's hand that uh, it could happen if 
he just wanted it to happen. I do have a couple uh, questions for you on that front, specifically dealing with uh, Speaker Boehner in just a second, but I wanted to focus back on Katala for a second. He's been charged in this attack now, and Anshal al Ansar al Saria in Yemen. Uh, the, a different branch of this same organization has been deemed a terror organization by the State Department. But shouldn't these charges against Katala now be enough to warrant a terror organization status for any group that aligns itself with Ansar al Sharia, uh, no matter what branch or where they're located? Clearly, uh, as to quote John McCain, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck. And clearly, that organization is clearly a terrorist organization which I think uh, the administration doesn't want to declare it, I'm guessing, because, you know, they, they supposedly they, they have defeated terrorism and it's not uh, terrorism we're fighting anymore. So what happens is they get caught up in their own rhetoric where they declare that there's not terrorism anymore, and you have a clear example of a terrorist organization. So for them, it's a challenge to try to uh, deal with one statement that they made earlier that terrorism is basically over and they won, blah, blah, blah. And now they turn around and we're seeing an explosion of terrorism around the world. And uh, yeah, the uh, new terror threats this week, an example of that. Um, you know, in addition to this, uh, this information coming out, I know you have also uh, spoken of how House Democrats are openly interfering with the Benghazi investigation. Aside from uh, some of the uh, witness intimidation tactics that we talked about, what else are House Democrats doing specifically to interfere with the investigation into the attack on the Benghazi consulate? Well, you, you see their comments that they're following their uh, leader and commander in chief and trying to trivialize it. But these folks that lost loved ones there are, don't, they don't think it's funny or trivial. And it's very disrespectful for them to delay a special prosecutor or interfere and continually, uh, do leaks or comments to, to trivialize the, the Magazi situation, as they call it, or it's really a, a horrible situation. Uh, uh, horrible problem is we have four Americans dead and no one wants to investigate it. It's, it's bizarre. Uh, we had spent more time on uh, Trayvon Martin uh, than we did on foreign policy, which could jeopardize other lives. It's, it's a tragedy in this nation that we somehow we lose our focus on, on things and, and drop the ball. This is a really serious case and unfortunately you know, we see the administration constantly and the Democrats in, in joining together and in, in stopping uh, the investigation. Now, let's get back to that discharge position. You and a number of other prominent House Republicans are continuing to press Speaker Boehner uh, from within Congress. And you talked about how you're asking uh, the folks who might be watching this right now and other folks uh, to press their own individual members of Congress, their representatives, to sign uh, this discharge position, which would basically force uh, a special select committee to investigate this, this attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, a special prosecutor as well. Um, you know, this seems to be gaining momentum now. We have these new revelations, the report from CNN uh, and, and the like. Do you see any reason why, though, uh, Speaker Boehner would now hold off on pushing for this uh, special select committee once you guys return from the August recess? I, uh, his, his theory is that the committees are doing their will, but the problem is, I agree with Frank Wolf on this, is it, it's not, it's, they're, they're not getting the results or the answers they need to. And a special prosecutor would actually have, I think, more ability to be more flexible to get uh, to the bottom of it. And uh, we, right now, the discharge petition literally is at the, in the well, they call it, down there where you see the speaker and the people roaming. That's, that's an actual physical paper that you have to go down and sign. And right now, we need, we, it desperately, if you're, if you're in support of investigating Benghazi, you need to get your member to sign that discharge petition to encourage the speaker to appoint a committee is outlined in Frank Wolf's bill. So uh, together we can get this done and pressure the speaker to do the right thing. But without action from the people in the grassroots, uh, Hillary and her cohorts may end up burying this whole uh, situation to the detriment of this nation and, and the people that lost lives there. Now, you, of course, have not been particularly happy with Speaker Boehner. You opposed his reelection as Speaker earlier this year. Uh, you know, on this issue and on other issues as well, do you believe that he has uh, the full support of the House Republican Caucus or even really enough support of the caucus to effectively do his job at this time? Well, I, you know, there's not a lot of good shot across the bow to get the uh, Speaker's attention. 
And uh, prior to that problem he had where I and others tried to oppose him, uh, he didn't listen to the conference at all, and, and some argue he's still not listening. But I, I think and I'm hoping that uh, that near-death experience will cause him to do the, the, you know, the right thing. And for instance, across the board on immigration, on the gods and other things, I'm hoping he'll listen to the conference and uh, take a leadership role in defending our, our nation by appointing a special prosecutor. So I'm, I'm still hopeful that he'll, uh, he'll do that. And so just to follow up on that real quick, do you believe that he has enough support or, or the full support of the caucus? If um, he'll lose more support, if he, if he does a, what's called a conference committee report on immigration and sends it to us from the, basically the Senate side, uh, you will see the whole thing blow up. So it depends, really, in my view, it depends on several actions in the coming three or four months. Uh, whether he shows the leadership uh, that needed uh, to uh, really direct our conference. So I'm waiting on to see his actions coming up because there's going to be some really tough votes coming. Yeah. And he's got he's to, I think, got to stick by the guns and not let uh, the president bully him into a weaker position. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot at stake here uh, for the speaker. And, uh, you know, I know you're enjoying your time away from Washington, D.C., but I do want to talk to you about what I think we can both agree is probably the most pressing issue facing Congress uh, when this recess ends, and that's the budget, the debt ceiling, a potential government shutdown, and Obamacare, and all, of course, they're all connected. Uh, there's real concern about uh, the collateral damage that could result if there is, in fact, a government shutdown, which Senators Ted Cruz, Mark Rubio and Mike Lee have threatened unless Obamacare is defunded. But I uh, read in the Houston Chronicle that you have an alternative plan that would still defund Obamacare, but also prevent a shutdown. Tell us about it. Yeah, we call it keep the government open. Now, mind you, I was there in 96 when, um, when we had a government shutdown. And people, uh, the press has not told us accurately. We actually had bills passed that kept the government open. The actual person that shut down was Bill Clinton when he vetoed those bills. So what we did is we introduced a, a bill that said Keep the Government Open Act, which funds everything but Obamacare. And if the president signs it, the government stays open and everybody's happy. But unfortunately, uh, we'll be characterized as something else. But it, we want to pass the bill, Keep the Government Open Act, and then uh, go around and promote the bill why, and not just turn it over to Obama until have him veto it right away. But uh, say, please sign this, uh, Mr. President, keep the government open. Yeah, you know, and there's, there's been some criticism, you know, about uh, these bills like this from even within the Republican Party. Um, you know, some folks, including Republicans, say that nothing's really going to change until uh, the GOP can get control of the Senate and get control of the White House. Uh, so, but I wanted to ask you, you know, to answer the concerns of those folks, what specifically differentiates your plan from the 40 or so other bills aimed at decapitating Obamacare that have faced that type of criticism uh, from even inside the GOP? Uh, some folks even calling those votes uh, empty gestures. Well, the thing is, is that we, the, the Congress, the lower house, has the right and the privilege to fund what we want. But actually, the Senate doesn't have that privilege. And uh, we can uh, fund whatever we want. And if we <clears throat> frame the network, if we argue on their terms and we lose the argument, what I'm saying is we need to argue. I mean, he called it the Affordable Care Act, and it's a joke because it's now $3 trillion, and if illegal aliens become legal, it'll be $6 trillion. So you're, you're talking about a bill with a misnomer name. And so I said, we are, as Republicans need to start marketing more clever and get our message out. And one of the things that we're doing wrong is we're accepting the argument that when we defund uh, Obamacare that we're closing the government down. We're not. We're, in fact, we're saving the nation futures uh, by not funding it. And it would be a, a huge burden off the backs of business to uh, to prevent that becoming in, becoming law. But we, as Republicans, we get out a calculator real quick and show us that the the bill doesn't cost X Y Z, and, and then the Democrats will bring out somebody in a wheelchair, and we lose the argument on visuals. So I think the main important thing is well, I want to shift the argument to uh, keeping the government open and not talk about keeping it closed or closing it because it's not accurate at all. Yeah, that's certainly, you know, one of those huge things uh, that can get uh, 
massaged and, and turned around and twisted in different ways depending on how it's reported. And a lot of people do forget uh, that the, uh, the nation's checkbook uh, does belong to the House of Representatives. It's their responsibility. So a key <coughs> distinction right there. Congressman Steve Stockton, a pleasure, Stockman, I should say, a pleasure talking with you. Have a great day, sir, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate taking my call. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV. Thank you.